accent. I'm from the UK, but I'm actually from Scotland, so you may have to get tuned into my accent a little here. Antonio started his presentation, I didn't know he was going to do this, with sport in Nadal. And, uh, you know, we invented tennis in the UK. And then it came to Spain, and they started beating us at tennis. We also invented football. We brought it to Spain. What did these guys do? They started hammering us at football, and still do, in European competitions. And in Scotland, where I come from, we, well, we didn't invent golf, but we sort of codified the rules. We gave it to the Spanish, and they started beating us at golf as well. But uh, the great thing about that story, in a sense, about sport is when things become global and excellent and they become a real consumer phenomenon, it's a wonderful thing. And I'm just watching Wimbledon now. By the way, anybody, anybody here from Scotland? Hey, great. Now, we do actually. This is ridiculous, but Andy Murray is even better than Nadal, to be honest now. And nobody in Scotland, it rains so much, nobody plays tennis. I can't remember ever seeing anybody playing tennis in Scotland. I don't know how that happened. But what I want to talk to you about today is that rising tide, that notion that consumer technology really does affect your lives. And as educators, it should affect the way you teach because it affects the way people learn. This is terribly important. But I'm not a great fan of all technology. I'm not just coming along to hammer out some technological evangelism to you. I really want to talk about technology in relation to one thing, and that's this little object here, the brain, the most complex object we know of in the universe. And it's all about this. It's all about learning theory. And so everything I say today, I will try and root in learning theory, not neuroscience. There's a lot of nonsense talked about that, but certainly learning theory. OK, sorry. OK, so the title of my talk today is Mind Blowing Tech. This is, this is a bit ambitious. So if you've got to fill in your evaluation sheet and I don't blow your mind, then it's going to be a bit disappointing for me, obviously. So I was coming over on the plane going, God, this is a bit of an ambitious title, this one. I thought about changing it. But there we are. What I'm going to show you now, however, is a piece of video. This is my sister a year ago. And I brought a bit of tech into her house in Scotland, and I put it on her head. And I want to show you what happened. She's on a roller coaster. Now I'm going to put her on a bungee jump. She's 150 meters up. She's going to fall off the edge, literally fall off the edge. So she's walking to the edge now, right on the lip. She's looking round. See, she waves. There are people behind her. She can see everything in this world. She is there. Now she's falling. <laughs> and she's upside down now, in her mind. Sorry, I had to pixelate that one for legal reasons. Now, do you think that blew my sister's mind? Damn right it did. And I've shown this thing all over the world, in Africa, in Europe, in the Far East, and it has the same reaction everywhere. And this thing will be launched as a consumer product in the first quarter of next year for $350. Facebook have invented $2.3 billion in this thing. It will happen. Now, imagine for a moment that we could take some of that magic dust from VR and put it into education. I've been heavily involved in vocational learning in England and on the board of the biggest accreditation body there, City and Guilds. I'm quite passionate about kids who don't go to university because that's the majority of kids still in most countries. Uh, because when it comes to practical learning, learning by doing, we have a chance perhaps of doing things cheaply 
and on a massive consumer scale in a way we never could before. So I think there are some exciting things happening here. But let me come back to down to earth for a little bit and make a really bold claim here. I'm 58 years old, but I do think there's been more pedagogic change in the last 20 years than in the last 2,000 years. And that's because of technology. You know, by and large, I'm in and out of universities all the time, speaking to students all the time. And basically, the one-hour lecture, which is still the core pedagogic technique in every university I know of, is the same now as it was 2,500 years ago in Plato's Academy. Exactly the same. Not much has really changed here, but radical things have happened amongst the learner community. We certainly have had a series of things, which I would call mind-blowing tech, and one, I'll talk about seven things here. The first one I'll talk about is mobile. How many people do not have a mobile phone here? I can't see a single hand. That's cool. Okay. The thing about mobile technology, don't for imagine for one minute that you're going to deliver undergraduate courses on a mobile phone. It ain't going to happen. The mobile phone is not about the delivery of courses, and I don't think it ever will be. Technology always surprises people. So when you look at how kids really do use phones, it's full of surprises. On the te top left-hand corner here, I commute. I don't drive. I don't, I've never driven a car. I use the train a lot. Every time I take the train in England, there is somebody nearby using the mirror to put her makeup on. I live in Brighton, which is the biggest gay community in Britain. Sometimes it's guys as well. The, any woman here ever used that application? Not one. Yeah, the hands are now going up. Some are too scared maybe to admit that. But it was a surprise, that application. The one on the right-hand side here, if you go to Africa, I spent a lot of time in Africa over the last three years. Everywhere you go in Africa, every phone has a small torch. And the reason for that is that in rural areas in Africa, electricity is scarce. An unexpected technical add-on to mobile phones has been the torch. The one on the bottom left-hand corner here, in India, 700,000 people use false calls on mobiles. In other words, they call and nobody answers. And the reason for that is it's free. So the free call, the phantom call, is now used not only in political campaigns and TV advertising, it's used in 101 different ways, unexpectedly. In other words, people use tech not in the way that you expect them to use technology, but in other wonderful ways. These are my two kids three years ago when they were 18. They're twin boys. The one on the left-hand side used to come up to our front door, and he would ring us on his mobile phone rather than press the doorbell. How weird is that? And the other one, who's a more sort of quiet guy, gamey guy up in his bedroom, two stories up, if we wanted him to come downstairs to get a meal, we had to phone him up. <laughs> you know, that's the way this stuff's used in an unexpected fashion. The you know the stuff I showed you with my sister? Well, that effect can now be delivered through a mobile phone. This is me with a Samsung Galaxy phone in one of these masks. And what you saw with my sister can be delivered now through a mobile phone. You can actually buy this now from Sony. So phones are not about the delivery of e-learning. They're about many, many other things. Some of the research I was involved in uh, in Africa, and I really love this woman, Cornelia Muganda from Tanzania. She's been looking at the way mobile phones have been raising literacy amongst young girls in Africa. Every young girl in Africa is desperate for a phone and desperate to learn how to not only text, but read texts, because it's a lifeline in rural Africa. It really matters in terms of employment and contact over those huge distances. These are the things we have to look at technology in terms of what they're going to be used for. And then recently, space practice, Ebbinghaus, 1885, told us, you're going to forget almost everything I say today. That's science. That's the science of forgetting. Before you have lunch, you'll have forgotten 30 to 40% of what I've told you this morning. How do we solve that problem? Well, Ebbinghaus told us that we have to have spaced practice across time after the learning event. How many of us actually do that? Hardly anyone in education takes that principle seriously. Why? Because they leave and you don't have contact with them. But they do all have mobile phones. You do have an umbilical cord to your learners now. And that's important. So unexpected uses. The second one I want to discuss is semantic. Now, you may think this is a bit esoteric. It doesn't affect me. 
that it does. If you use Google, then you'll be using semantic techniques. Don't imagine that Google is just about a core set of algorithms, pattern matching, finding the answers to your questions. I think Google has effected the greatest pedagogical change in the last 20 years that we've ever seen. It has been a massive pedagogic shift in terms of the access of knowledge for learners and academics. Every single one of your students uses Wikipedia, which is the sixth most popular site on the web. Every one of them uses Google. It's the key access to knowledge for adults in our age. And it uses semantic techniques. They have patented loads of semantic web techniques. And you'll find this happening. You will already have found that Google is getting better and better because of these techniques every day. And one of the things that makes semantic web work, because meaning matters in learning, meaning really does matter, is the hyperlink. Okay? The humble hyperlink is really what makes the web sing. So we have Wikipedia. When you look at what kids do in Wikipedia, they very rarely read a whole page. They hyperlink across knowledge. And why do they hyperlink across knowledge? Why is it the sixth most popular website on our planet? The reason is our brains don't store stuff like a video recorder in any linear fashion. They don't store stuff alphabetically. They don't store stuff hierarchically. And yet almost all learning content, all curricula, lectures, textbooks, Wikipedia pages even, are linear in structure. And yet the brain is a network which works on semantic principles. As long as we simply deliver linear stuff to people, this job will be hard. Your job is hard. It's even harder in schools. However, some things are coming along. The semantic web opens up new possibilities. If you've looked at curating content, if you're an academic and you've been trying to curate good stuff from YouTube, other sources perhaps, other than just the standard one-hour lecture, you'll know how tricky it is to find stuff. We now have good bits of software. This is one from... Actually, the origins of this was a research project in Trinity College in Dublin, I think of Learnivate, took it out. You can now, as a learner, look and curate your own content. It will go to Wikipedia, Flickr, YouTube, and find stuff that's suited to you as a learner because it knows who you are, what you know, already know, what you need to know, and keeps you on track. This thing called Wiki, you can type any Wikipedia URL in there, you can actually type any word in, like measles or whatever, and the thing will semantically search for good content on the web. In this case, if you type uh, measles in, it will go and find a picture of a kid with measles. It will then do some assessment. It will then, if you're in doubts about rubella and you have trouble identifying rubella, which is often mistaken for measles in healthcare, then that button will be highlighted, you click on rubella, you go to the rubella page on Wikipedia, and it follows the learner. It creates learning automatically, creates assessment automatically as you move through the content. This is the things that semantic techniques can do for us. Some wonderful things happening on that front. Okay, number three, augmented reality. That's different from the thing I showed you with my sister. Here, and the big news is Microsoft's HoloLens. So you put the little mask on the top here, and you can see things in the real world. So if I were looking at you as an audience, and I wanted to bring up, let's say I was looking at you, sir, I could bring up your little biography, and I could cheat by saying things that may surprise you. But it would also bring up physical objects and literally overlay them onto the real world. How can that actually help us in the learning world? Well, when you walk through an environment, it can bring up stuff automatically in front of you as you move. As an architect, an engineer, it can bring up the real objects in front of you. In games, it can bring up Minecraft on the table right in front of you. But even more amazing, sorry, this leaps forward a little bit. If you look at Magic Leap, this company has raised half a billion dollars on day one without any customers, half a billion dollars. Why did they raise half a billion dollars? Because they have perfected a technique for projecting an object straight onto the retina. In other words, when I look out at you, this little machine here will simply place things on my retina and absolutely seamlessly integrate them with what I'm seeing in the real world, okay? So this little elephant, 
would literally appear in my hands. And it would look like a real elephant, a 3D elephant, in the cusp of my hands. Imagine the things we could do with that technology. However, in the near term, the big news is virtual reality. And the reason for this is that in the first quarter of next year, we'll have the launch, some of them have already launched, but almost every major tech company in the world is piling money into this. Because VR is a medium, it's not a gadget. Don't imagine that this little headset here, and everyone, by the way, can have a shot of this if you want today. I'll hang around today. If you want to have that experience that my sister had, you can. It's actually a medium. It's a new medium like television, like film, like radio. Because you will enter a new world, any world you want to imagine. The only limit is your imagination. You will enter that world. And it's not like the movies. It's not like the movies where you can come out and look at your popcorn. When you're in that world, you're damn well in there because your reptile brain screams at you and says you're there. And think of the possibilities we have in education and some of these projects I've been involved in. So this is the Oculus Rift. $350, you'll be able to buy it in February of next year. $350. Some amazing technology in this thing. You'll also actually have a little ring, a couple of ring things you can buy here. Why would you have that? Well, when you put one of these virtual reality helmets on, the first thing you do is you're, you reach out with your hands because you're in the world. You want to grab things. And of course, in the real world, if you're looking at education, if you're looking at engineering and building, maintaining things, fault finding, you will want to manipulate objects in the real world. That would be certainly something you would do in almost every aspect of physical engineering. The use of tools for measurement, the physical manipulation of those tools, even reading meters, lab work in physics, chemistry, biology, all of that can be done using this consumer technology. And even soft skills. I've been involved in a soft skills project recently because you will have gesture recognition, voice recognition. You will be in this new world with other people Remember, it was bought by Facebook. They want to take the whole of Facebook into a 3D virtual reality world. That's their goal. And we could have this conference by not coming to Barcelona. We could literally have this conference by sitting at home, and it would seem bloody real, as real as my sister experienced it on the video. So remember this figure, 2.3 billion. The first market will be the games market. That's fine. That's how stuff gets into education. It hits other markets first and then comes to us. Uh, believe me, some of these games, when you try them, are absolutely terrifying. You think you'd be frightened at paranormal movies? <laughs> you try one of these games. They will scare you shitless. Uh, let me give you a little example here. Can we play this video? This girl was very quiet just before this. I saw the, the, the rushes of this before it was shot. So you see what I mean? They, they, you, know, you have no choice when you're in these things. It's such an all-embracing experience. And wouldn't be that be great in education if we could actually have that for real educational experiences at a much calmer level? I don't think it all has to be high adrenaline stuff. This is an interesting thing that's happened, which I think is totally relevant to some educational applications. These are gender swap experiments in virtual reality. So that if I was wearing a mask, and this lady in the front row was wearing a virtual reality mask, and we swapped our viewpoints, I could see what you see, you see what I see. I look down, I have a female body. You look down, you have a male body. I've tried this. It is the weirdest thing. It's the weirdest thing, guys, <laughs> to be a woman. Now, what, how is that relevant to education? Well, I used to run a big e-learning company, and we, I mean, we used to have millions of dollars worth of compliance training on sexual harassment and so on. And I remember, do you remember Second Life? I had a female avatar in Second Life, and I used to go to bars as this female avatar. Believe me, guys, if you want to know about sexual harassment, <laughs> get an avatar who's female and go to a bar in Second Life. Three minutes, you get how serious that issue is. Imagine a US cop who became that black kid for half an hour who was getting stopped every day of their life. Imagine those role-playing swaps that we could now affect in this newer world. There are some wonderful opportunities available for us on this front. This is a program which we've just finished uh, using virtual reality for care workers in healthcare. In other words, in the UK, these are minimum wage. They get no training. 
It's a terrible job. Lots of young people who struggle to get the competencies in looking after older people in care homes. So we have a map out of the competencies. You build the 3D world, which is the care home, and then you go in and really, really get tested in the competencies. Let me give you an example. Uh, my sister was a nurse for many years. Every nurse will tell you that when you go into a room with elderly patients, you say your name. Why do you say your name? Because they may see you in a slightly vague or fuzzy way because of poor eyesight. They may have some dementia, and they may have met you a hundred times but forgotten your name. So it's important that. That's a competence. You can teach this with ease in this virtual reality world. Okay? You can mimic what it's like as a physician or a nurse or a carer to have actual physical disabilities. In this case, eyesight disabilities. You can actually see by mimicking it in software what it's like to have macular degeneration and so on. Hearing problems. This thing has 3D audio in the kit. Uh, and then for all those physical vocational training things, you can also, we've just finished a program on construction, where you walk onto a building site, and if you don't know the exact ladder angle to put it up, I can tell you it's 70 degrees, then you'll put the ladder up and make the mistakes and pay for those mistakes in a game-like fashion, but you will learn the competencies before you go on and do damage to yourself on a real building site. And this is a full health and safety program that can be done on something that can be replicated a million times for peanuts. I used to teach maths, and one of the, uh, one of the things I, I did when I first got my kit was got hold of some eight to 10-year-olds and was teaching them physics. I don't know if you've ever tried to teach young people Newton's three laws. It takes about two years to get them to sink in. They're, ter they're counterintuitive. They're terribly difficult to learn. But there's an application on the Oculus Rift where you put the mask on, okay, this little mask thing, and suddenly you're floating around the International Space Station. You're literally looking at it. You can look around space, look at the Earth, and you're in a space suit. And you press the button, and of course, you move forward because there's a little rocket pushing you forward. That's Newton's first law. F equals negative F. Every force has an equal and opposite reaction. The kid feels the law. They know that law, they will never forget it. The really tricky Newtonian law, and every kid does the same thing. They press the button, and they go forward, and they smash into the space station. Boom, why? Because on Earth, friction would slow you up, but in space, there is no friction. And every object, as Newton discovered, will go on ad infinitum until another force acts upon it. This is very counterintuitive. We didn't know this before Newton. Every kid within two minutes understands that law. Then you ask the kid, why are people floating in the International Space Station? And what do they answer? Zero gravity. Wrong answer, but that's what they all say. Gravity in the space station is almost the same as it is in the surface of the Earth. This is how difficult physics is to teach. Actually, it's because the space station is falling and falling and falling towards the Earth. That's what orbits are. And the two forces cancel each other out, which is why people float. Again, the kid gets it immediately. And in F equals MA, how do you think the thing got up there? In other words, within about 20 minutes, you can achieve what it may take months, if not years, to do from a blackboard or a flip chart or a whiteboard. That's the opportunities that this stuff offers. Now, yeah, let me play this. <laughs> Holy crap. It doesn't matter what age I show this to. You know, even with elderly people, it's even more amazing for them because it sort of takes you back to your youth. You know that vivid world that you suddenly experience? They're stuck in a home, you know, abandoned by their relatives, and suddenly they're reliving their lives. And I've, another interesting area in healthcare that some people are looking at is on depression, a massive problem. And rather than the pharmaceutical solution, this thing can lift your mood in five seconds. Imagine that opportunity of just mood enhancement immediately as opposed to, if you suffered from depression, the immediate horror of dipping into that hole. There are all sorts of interesting things happening on this front that we should take, pay attention to. And remember, Facebook isn't a games company. The reason that Zuckerberg bought this thing was that there were no customers. He still spent his $2.3 because he thinks this will change the world, as I do. 
And look at this quote. Imagine studying in a classroom with students and teachers all over the world just by putting your goggles on in your home. I don't actually think that's how this will happen in education, but he's on to something. He wants to focus. This was in the press release on launch. This is a market that he's aiming at. And in terms of learning theory, well, let's think about this. Psychological attention is a necessary condition for learning. You get total focus, total attention in this world. Emotion. I've already showed you the emotional input you get, often lacking in education. You know that effective, emotional, motivational side of things? You can learn by doing. I think in the liberal arts tradition in the Western world, we've abandoned that. And that's not a good thing, I don't think. You know, look at the news. Look at the youth unemployment in Southern Europe and in Africa and Northern Africa and the Middle East. If we think that a purely academic solution is a solution to youth unemployment, I think we should think again. I think maybe reintroducing learning by doing would be a good thing. This provides real context, transfer of skills to the real world. We know that's true because flight simulators have been around for 60 years. You wouldn't have flown here in an airplane unless your pilot had gone through 300 hours of virtual reality training on a simulator. It works, guys. You don't have to worry about that. That's well proven. And of course, it increases retention. When you do these things, just like these kids I was doing in physics, God, do you remember the stuff because of that impact. Okay, let's turn to another one. Now, this is even bigger, I think, in terms of the future. I, I blog a lot. I've been blogging for 10 years, and every year about Christmas, they say, what's going to happen? Can you write a blog on what's going to happen for my magazine next year? And last year, I said only two letters, AI, artificial intelligence. This is huge. Okay? Now, it's not as if artificial intelligence came from nowhere. We have had 2,500 years of mathematics lying behind it from Euclid, who actually defined the first algorithm. Uh, and then Aristotle with syllogistic work in logic, al Khwarizmi, the great Arab scholar who gave us the word algorithm, Descartes with that notion of the mind as a computational device, and then this squad of people in probability theory, Boole, Frege, Pascal, Fermat, Laplace, Cardano, Bernoulli, and Bayes. And we've come to a critical point now where all the maths has come together and things are starting to work. This algorithmic approach actually does work. And if you don't think it does, how does it work? Well, if you imagine the algorithms as a rocket, suddenly we have the fuel. We have the fuel of data from the World Wide Web. We have masses of fuel, which allows the rocket to take off. That's why Google works. If Google only had three users, it wouldn't work. It has one and a half billion users, so it works well. And that's what's going to happen, I think, in education. And it's not a matter of mimicking the mind. And the EU have a $1 billion research project in trying to mimic the workings of the mind and artificial intelligence, a hopeless, hopeless project. And it's hopeless because we didn't learn to fly by just copying what birds do and the flapping of wings. That's not the point. The point is to learn what we have to do by inventing new technology that allows us to fly. And that's what AI is starting to do now. It's not mimicking the brain. It's doing things in a way that are better than the brain. If you've all used Google's, uh, Google, you will be using algorithms, absolutely, and you will have been using artificial intelligence for 10 or 15 years. If you use Facebook, your newsline, increasingly any ads you see, algorithmically delivered. If you do online dating, I'm not going to ask to put your hands up on that one, but if you use eHarmony, they will be matching you, and why not? If you're trying to find a mate, wouldn't you want to know that the chances of having a great relationship with that person for the rest of your life is heightened? by the knowledge of the system, and it takes data from other people who they've tried to match in the past, why not? Rather than the rather, who, when they first get married, accepts the probability that there's about a 50-50 chance you're going to be divorced? <laughs> Nobody would say, yeah, that's probably right, but actually it's mathematically true. <laughs> but we live with that. In sport, if you go to the New Camp Stadium across the road there, you will find people fully employed in data analytics and predictive analytics, looking at training and transfers, the opposition, the way you're going to play. This is big business in sport. It's also big business in Amazon. If you've bought a book on Amazon, it will know, the algorithm will know who you are, what books you didn't buy, how long you looked at the book you didn't buy. It will be matching it to your personal preferences. And if you don't think that works, about 20 to 23% of Amazon's revenue comes from that algorithmic power. You may not think you're fooled into buying the stuff, but you are. I don't think it's fooling you. I think it's useful. In Netflix, 
television. The BBC in the UK have just laid off 1,000 people. One of the reasons is people aren't paying their license fee because young people are not watching television any longer. They're doing it online and watching stream stuff. Netflix is the new warrior. Why has Netflix been uniquely successful? Because they had a million dollar prize which said, come up with some good algorithms that predict what users want to watch next on movies and television programs. And boy, did it work. There was a couple of young, bright academics who won the prize. And if you use Netflix, and tens of millions of people do, then your choices are guided by algorithmic choices. And 75% of their revenue comes from an algorithmic push. So if it's working in all these other areas of human endeavor, why not in education? It already, on Watson's uh, AI system, already beat the two world champions in America's most famous game on TV. And that's now available. You can buy that service online. There's a freemium service in that as well. How does it actually work, however, in learning? Well, it comes down to adaptive learning, OK? This is algorithms in action. And the idea here is that you educate everyone uniquely, not that 300 people in a lecture room. But everyone gets your attention, OK? Because if you're teaching maths, then traditionally it would have been that linear structure at the top. In actual fact, maths is a network of content down the bottom. And what you have to do is personalize it. You have to make sure that each, it's, it's catastrophic teaching maths. People who lecture for three hours on algebra to students should be shot through the head. They know nothing about pedagogy. That's the truth of the matter. And that happens every day in almost every university I know of. It's appalling. That's why we have catastrophic failure in our schools in the subject, because algorithms are much smarter than that. They ignore gender. I need to go through this because time is short. The bottom line here is that they work, they will work, and they will start to creep into your system. The systems are already there. Gamification, if you use Duolingo, I highly recommend it if you want to learn a second language. Most kids in England spend five years trying to learn French, German, Spanish. And as all Spanish people know, when they arrive in Spain, they can't order a beer. <laughs> it's a total catastrophe, a total area of failure. So we're looking at gamification coming into the market. I'm not so keen on treating uh, users like Pavlovian dogs, you know, this notion. You've got to be careful with games. Don't distract. Don't disappoint. Crap games are just not worth doing it. It costs money. You're going to have cognitive overload. If you want to do this well, do it well or don't do it at all. The last one here. OK, Mary, the last one is space practice. My time's over, but let me just quickly rush through this. This guy was the world champion table tennis player in England. And the other five people below him in the rankings for 10 years all came from two streets near him. The reason? Practice, practice, practice. We know that Ebbinghaus said that you will forget everything I've just told you, and that's true. The truth, truth of the matter is you need to hook this stuff up and get repeated practice over time. You can do that by tweeting. You can do it by tailing topping and tailing your lectures. You can do it by note-taking. You can do it by tweeting, which I think is a form of space practice. I remember the things I tweet at conferences. But really, the way to do this is to get proper software that takes the learning event and delivers it to the learner via mobile technology in all sorts of clever mathematical ways that I don't have time to go into. But if you deliver this through your mobile phone and through things like the Apple Watch, then I think you'll be getting somewhere to solving that retention problem. That science is the science of learning. OK? So hopefully, I will have convinced you that some of these technologies, it doesn't matter, actually. I really do think that resistance is futile. Uh, it doesn't matter what you think of Wikipedia. All your students are using it. It doesn't matter what you thought of email, Google. All your students use it. And all your students will be using this stuff as well. Resistance is absolutely futile. So we as educators, I think, have a duty to embrace the technology. We absolutely have a duty to embrace it and not hate it. Why on earth would somebody, I know schools in England that ban Wikipedia. They ban it. They've actually blocked it. Can you really take yourself seriously as an educator by denying young people access to the biggest knowledge base in the world? I think not. Thank you very much for listening.